one of the things that's important to know is that grasses are an exceptionally important part of our community. Um, and what's important about grasses is they're found everywhere. In every niche of our universe, we have grasses available to us. Many, many different kinds, as you can imagine. What's interesting about Texas is because of our very diverse geography, our diverse topography, our weather and climate, of course, we have many, many different regions of Texas that have different vegetative characteristics to it. And we, as scientists, have divided the state into 10 really important areas. And the reason for this is they're somewhat unique based on those factors that I just discussed. So from the Piney Woods in the east, which by the way, is the westernmost segment of the United States Eastern, Great Eastern uh, forest lands. Extends over, as you know, toward, uh, almost toward the Houston area, but at least Beaumont and those areas. And then we have the coastal areas, we have the Panhandle areas, and of course, the part that I call uh, Trans-Pecos, West, Texas west of the Pecos. But the area that we're interested in the most, of course, is the Edwards Plateau. But based on that, we know that we can find grasses in every climate, every vegetative area, in every habitat within Texas, including the piney woods, uh, the gulf marshes and prairies, and here you can see gulf cord grass, and a lot of really interesting grasses down there. The post oak savanna, is a woodland area that's uh, separated with vast areas of grasses now, many of which are, of course, cultivated. But we get into the Blackland Prairies, South Texas Plains, even in the Tamalipas Thorn Scrub, which is a really, really dense, scrubby, almost impenetrable area. We've got grasses that are very, very uh, prolific. And of course, in the Texas Hill Country, even though we have a juniper oak uh, transition zone from habitat, we get a lot of different grasses and this is where our interest in the grasses initially grew. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while. Uh, but as we go up north and west, we go into the rolling plains and the high plains of Texas, which are remnants in many areas of the great grasslands that made the western part of the United States famous, where the grasses were high as an elephant's eye, so to speak, and those settlers and all of the explorers that went predominantly from the Mississippi River area and pushed westward through our lands, expanding our country to what we have now, pushed through these grasslands and they had never seen anything like that before in their life. They had never ridden on horseback through grasses that were as high as their knees when they were on horseback. And it was a very, very dramatic scene. It was a very uh, interesting and very uh, uh, rewarding experience to, uh, to pass through those grasslands. But even if we go to uh, Texas west of the Pecos, all right, so the question arose once upon a time, why would everybody or anybody want to study grasses? Well, I have to ask the question first, did you all eat grass today? And the answer is, of course, yes. We had our bowl of Wheaties, or we had a slice of bread, or we had many other things that have grass as a constituent, so flour and uh, brand grains and all those kind of things. These are grasses or grass products that we eat. So now what's really interesting is in our own plant communities in the Hill Country and the Edwards Plateau, we have over 600 species of grasses that make up our uh, vegetative plant community. And 
and as I said in my slide here, it's the second largest plant community, meaning in species numbers. And somebody would ask the question, what's the largest? And the largest is the sunflower family. So we have more sunflowers than anything, and we, there are many, many different species, lots of different plants. But we have over 600 species of grasses in, uh, in Texas. Uh, now, in the hill country, we have about half of that, 280 or so species of grasses. And they're important as a food for cattle and uh, other forms of uh, grazing animals. Uh, we also have it as a habitat for shelter and food and other nesting materials for wildlife. And of course, let's not overlook this, it's a very, very valuable resource for restoration of lands that are barren or, or let's say overworked or overused in the past years and for stabilization of soils from wind and water erosion and other forms of uh, decimation by, by nature. And grasses are everywhere. And like I say, grasses are where we are. Now, this is on Highway 281 between Blanco and San Antonio, Texas. Now, what's really important about this is my wife, Shirley, and many of you know who Shirley is, and I were driving to our son's wedding down this section of road. And all of a sudden, we saw this. This was about 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's very nicely backlit. It makes a really, really great photograph. And even though we were headed to the wedding, we had to stop and get out our gear and make photographs because it was very, very important to see. It was very demonstrative. I think we identified like 30 different species of grass in this one area. The predominant grass that you see here is silver blue stem. And the really nice purplish is uh, Gulf muley. And then, of course, there's an awful lot of little blue stem in this pasture as well. Sadly to say today, this particular piece of land is a housing development. So we're losing a lot of our original grassland habitats to human encroachment. Now, we can't say that's a bad thing, but we're saying it's a thing that's happening and it's moving into our wild lands and into our natural habitats and our environment a lot. So we have to be cautious and careful about how we do that. And if we're good land stewards, we need to uh, always be mindful of our effect on the landscape. This is a scene literally a uh, half a mile from my house, right here in central Austin, Texas. Uh, this was taken 10 years ago. It's a really beautiful corner. This is on the corner of Parmer Lane and uh, McNeil. Uh, and it's a really interesting pastoral scene complete with its water mill, uh, or excuse me, windmill and all those other things. Um, this is on the same uh, property uh, up the road, just a little bit, as is this. What's really interesting about this piece of property is this very tall plant that you see is about five foot tall, almost six foot tall in many cases. This is bushy blue stem grass. And what bushy blue stem grass does for us is provide an indicator of very uh, abundant subsurface water. So when the water table is high, in other words, it's not very deep to get to water, we'll see a lot of influx of bushy blue stem. We'll talk about a lot of these a little bit more in just a minute. Uh, hang on just a second. Let me make an adjustment here. Okay, now, next slide is a, a, a view of a little bit of a roadside uh, bar ditch, so to speak, 
uh, that's literally a quarter of a mile from my house. And this is yellow Indian grass. This is a very, very prolific stand of yellow Indian grass. And as we'll discuss in a moment, this is one of the original big tall grasses of the great American prairies. Uh, and this stand is still flourishing. Uh, periodically, uh, we get uh, water that goes through here and then every once in a while they'll come and mow it. But uh, other than that, it's still a very good uh, bit of grassland. This is one of my favorite places. This is over in the, the borderland area between the western perimeter of Travis County and the eastern uh, perimeter of uh, Burnett County, and it's on Cow Creek Road running right off of Highway uh, 1341, west of uh, Cedar Park. This area I call my big spot. And what, what I mean by big spot is I have photographed over 50 species of grasses in this one little area, which is only, well, if you walk around through it, it's probably the equivalent of an acre and a half, maybe a little bit more. And what causes this to happen, this proliferation of, of grasses, is the fact that it's in a habitat that begins at its lowest elevation at a creek, Cow Creek. And then it moves uphill uh, for about 200 feet in change in elevation uh, to a limestone cliff area. So we have all of this silt deposits, we have limestone growth, we have a little bit of black land that was deposited there by alluvial floods uh, in past years. So it's a very fertile uh, area of, of grasses. We'll show you more from this area in a bit. But people would say, why would you ever write a book on grass? Well, I'll tell you the honest truth, it was done by accident. And I'll explain that. We were doing a lot of work at a wildlife area here in southwestern Austin. And the owners slash managers of this wildlife area said, we need a field guide of grass. Well, I didn't, at the moment, didn't realize she was meaning just for that habitat. And I said, okay, we'll do it. And so we went and produced a book on grass took the proposal and some original photographs and stuff to Texas A&M University Press, where I had some contacts from previous book work. And they said, what a wonderful idea. Let's do a book. And so we just fell into it there. Now, I can tell you, first and foremost, yes, I'm a biologist by degree. Uh, but I am not a grass specialist per se. My real specialty is on cell biology and things that are very small. But we positioned the book to be a very useful tool for people like you, naturalists and educators, cattlemen and people who own lands and wanted to understand their lands and protect them and to improve them. That would include commercial landscapers, of course. Now, as uh, Diane said earlier, I teach at Texas A&M in Kingsville. And when I first went there, I created a proposal to uh, produce this uh, syllabus and this group of classes and the courses that I teach. And in the audience was T.O. Kleberg. And T.O. is, of course, a descendant of the King Ranch and for a lot of years was the president of the King Ranch. And he said something that was very important in a very short statement. If you're very interested in something, could be land or, or property or grasses or a species of animals, you'll learn about it. And when you learn about it, you'll understand more about it and you'll want to protect it and conserve it. And that's the real trick of conservation of anything, whether it is a chunk of land or whether it's a particular series of 
plants or animals or whatever. If you like it, you'll learn about it. And if you learn about it, you'll conserve it. Now, previously with books, a lot of times the technology was not available to do photographs of grass any justice. Uh, and so most of the time, authors used very, very carefully produced line drawings that were done in India ink and uh, white paper. Now, about those. What they did was a drawing can't be as uh, quite as versatile as a photograph, in my opinion. It indicates from an artist's perspective a grass like one that they have in their hand. Now, we found that those drawings didn't necessarily coincide with the way grasses in Texas look. And that's true for anywhere. Now, what's really interesting about those drawings is that the authors of many of these grasses books shared the same drawing. Uh, and we'll go on from that here in a minute. But what what's interesting is that in addition to these drawings, many of these books had a lot of tedious language by biologist or botanist, and they had what's called dichotomous keys in the back that if you were going to identify a grass or any other plant for that matter, you'd have to go through a either or dichotomous question and answer. Is it blue or is it green? Or does it have pointy leaves or serrated leaves? And those kind of things. So we found that both of those two things were not palatable to us as lay people when it came to grasses. And we wanted something that was of value to people just like you, who were plant enthusiasts or grass enthusiasts, uh, native plant or wildflower people that could get some benefit out of understanding more about the plants that were around them. And so we tried to create a new perspective of grasses and we wanted to make pictures that give somebody a real good look of the grass at hand. So we had very, very large and highly detailed photographs. As I said before, previous technology did not lend itself well to that in publishing. But today, through digital publishing, and in fact, what's really interesting is our grass book was the last analog book that Texas A&M did before they got into digital. So we wanted to have the views of what grasses looked like when they were growing in a habitat. So we wanted to not only have large detailed photographs like of the seed head, but habitat views of the way that the grass could be found. Uh, we also needed to have seed close-ups because we discovered that the way to really truly identify one grass from another is probably best done by examining the seed head or the inflorescence for several characteristics that separates it from others. So back to the drawings. On the left is a drawing of a plant called sand drop seed. It's found in Texas. It's not rare. It's in a lot of different places. That's the drawing out of the book. And we, for several months, looked for this plant and couldn't find it. Only to discover, once we did find it, and you see the photograph on the right, we discovered that the seed head never opens up in Texas. It's still constricted a lot by the... Uh, uh, the, the structures that keep it closed. And we kept looking for a grass that looks very open and has a large panicle, kind of like Johnson grass. And that's not the way it really looks. So we decided, okay, let's bring 
more ideas to people so that they can understand more about grass so they can appreciate grasslands, study grasslands, and conserve grasslands. When we look at grass, we realize that more than 20% of all the plant life on Earth is a grass. And there's over 10,000 species of them that have evolved over half a billion years of evolution. Now, we also learn through our historical finds and our archaeology that people for over 10,000 years have cultivated rice for food. Maybe not huge rice fields like we've seen, but maybe smaller plots, but rice has been a staple for human consumption for over 10,000 years. And wheat even now more than that because it covers more land mass than other plants around the world. And grasses cover every single habitat. Now, what's interesting to know is, let's look at the structure of a grass and talk about what it really is, okay? Now, it is a vascular plant. And in the plant world, vascular plants means they have roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds. They also have a internal what's called vascular system, meaning piping and tubing and those kind of water or let's say fluid conducting vessels that distribute food, water, and nutrient throughout the plant and gives it an opportunity to uh, expel waste in the same manner. They are monocotyledons. Their plant family is called Poaceae. Uh, or Graminaeis in some books, uh, but they're generally thin plants, they're mostly erect, and they're generally green in appearance, unless you're looking outside today. Now, the real characteristic anatomical structures of a grass is they have long, round, and hollow stems. That's a very, very basic and very important differentiation they're long and thin, clasping leaves, and I'll show you that in detail, and they have large specialized seed heads. And during the flowering and seeding portion of grasses, that's one of the biggest parts of the biomass of grass is the seed head. Now, there's this little sing song that a lot of you have probably learned over the years that says, sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have nodes all the way to the ground. And that's really the differentiation between sedges, rushes, and grasses. And a lot of times people go out in the field and they pick up something and they say, this is a really interesting grass. Well, mistakenly, they may have a, a sedge or a rush in their hand. So let's look at the three of those for a moment. The biggest thing is sedges have a solid triangular stem. In other words, it's solid and if you roll it around in your finger, you feel ridges on it, just like rolling a yellow uh, wooden pencil. You can feel the, uh, the edges of the triangular stem. They have little bitty flowers and generally alternately narrow leaves, so does grass, but the biggest differentiation is the triangular stem. Now on the, on the rushes on the hand, they have solid stems, but they are, uh, I'm sorry, they have round stems, but they are solid. So they have a pith in them. So if you were to take a rush, cut it in half, you'd find that unless instead of a hollow tube, it would have pith or some kind of central material. Now grasses are hollow stems and they're round and they have nodes all the way down the plant stem from the seed head to the ground. Sedges and rushes do not do that. Okay, so there's three really solid keys to be able to determine whether you have a sedge, a rush, or a grass. Now, a typical grass has growth, obviously, above ground and below ground. So let's look at those structures as we go through here. 
grasses will start underground. We'll start with the root system. Grasses have very long, thin, fibrous roots, or they have underground stem sections called rhizomes, okay? Now, the rhizome picture on the left is uh, a rundo donax or river cane. And one of the things that makes river cane so very, very difficult to eradicate is not the above ground growth, but it's the below ground rhizome growth that is very, very hard. And you can't burn it down, you can't cut it down and kill it. You have to get and plow up every little bit of all these rhizomes. Now, we said grasses have round, hollow stems. Here's a picture of a grass hollow stem. Two things are very obvious in this photograph. Number one, it's round and it's hollow. But number two, you can see all in this cross section, you can see all these little tubes. And these tubes are the vascular ducts, the vascular system that transports fluids and nutrients throughout the uh, stem of the plant. It also has green leaves. They're, as you can see here, they're clasping leaves. They clasp to the stem. And the stem is basically uh, round and has nodes all the way to the ground. Now, speaking of nodes, this is actually a node, okay? So here's the stem and here's the node. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail, which is here. So the node is basically a, let's call it a, incorrectly a joint when it's not really a joint per se, but it is a section of growth on the plant stem that gives rise to leaves and or perhaps roots, okay? Now, on this grass stem, this is the stem, this is the node. And above the node, you're actually seeing the base or the sheath of the leaf that's growing from this node and growing upward. Now, that leaf clasps the stem way up above the node. So the node in this particular picture is several inches out of this picture, way back down here. Here's the leaf that's growing from the node out of the scene. And here's the beginning of a leaf in the upper one. So here's the node of this upper leaf. And this leaf is growing from the node below. Okay. Now, grasses have really sometimes very, very large seed heads, which we call inflorescence. It's the area where the flowers grow. And it's generally a section that is out beyond the tip of the, of the terminal leaf or the apical leaf, the last leaf on the stem. And it has sometimes many, many branches. Now, what's really important, we said that grasses are vascular plants and they're flowering vascular plants. And these are grass flowers. And in this picture, you see two forms, yellow ones and pink ones. This is yellow Indian grass, and the yellow flowers are the female flower components, and the red ones are the male flower or those that produce the gamete or the pollen, and they'll pollinate the flower, the, the female flower, on the same plant. So you don't have to have two plants with grasses for pollination. Now, after pollinating, the flowers give rise to a spikelet, which produce seeds. This is a spikelet of uh, big muley or Muhlenbergia uh, lindheimeri. And in here, the very small centerpiece you can see is the seed, and it's covered by three seed coats, which we call the lemma and the pala. You don't need to know that. It's in the notes in the handout. But these are very, very small. So we've got two seed components that make up the spikelet of this particular grass. So the question now comes to 
how do you identify grasses? Well, we talked about one major thing, and it's the seed head. And the seed head gives rise to all of these uh, stems and branches that are important in identification. So when we look at it, we can find seven basic variations of seed head types, which really arise from only three different kinds, a spike, a raceme, and a panicle. Now let me show you what I'm talking about here for just a minute. Let's think about this. A spike is very, very simple. It has the center stem and it has seeds that grow right on the stem. There's no little uh, pedicel or uh, stem to the seed at all. The, the seed grows right on the main center stem. This is Canada wild rye. And wild rye has a lot of really hairy structures called awns, A-W-N, and they're attached to the seed coat, and that seed is, uh, grows directly on this spike that creates a spike, seed head type. Now, we have a raceme. Now, a raceme has a center spike, and then we have seeds that have a stalk or a pedicel. But on a spicate raceme, like little blue stem, we have not only the structure of a spike, but also the structure of a raceme. And that's why when you look at little blue stem, the flower head looks very, very busy and very, very complicated in its structure, and it truly is. So you can see the, the seeds that grow right on the stem and the seeds that have a spike giving it this characteristic. Now, one of the interesting uh, plants that we have is Bermuda grass, and everybody may have Bermuda grass as a lawn grass, or it is a common turf grass found in Texas, and it is a panicle. Now, what I mean by a panicle is that it has a central stem, it has other adjacent stems that branch from it, okay? Now, on the branches, we have seeds that form right on the branch itself, meaning that they're spikes. So this is a spicate branch, and because it looks like fingers, we call it a digitate spicate branch. So now we have uh, a picture that comes up that is alternate spicate branches. So we have the same as before. We have the, the one before was a panicle of digitate. They're all at the terminal end and they uh, have a branch. And now we have those that branch alternately on the stem. One left, one right, one left, one right. Okay. Uh, and this is a picture of vasy grass. And you can see here's a central spike we have all these little seeds. And in fact, in this picture, you can actually make out flowers that are hanging at the bottom of this lower uh, spike. So it's a very easy grass to identify. And then we have one that is really vertical in its construction, like windmill grass. Uh, we have several windmill grasses in Texas. And as you notice, all of these spike gate branches join from the central stem in like little helicopter blades in a stacked up manner from one to the other. Okay. So this is short spike windmill grass and it's a verticillate or vertical spikeate branch plant. Now the two most probably most common grass seed head types are called panicles. Here is a contracted panicle, and this one is an open panicle. The difference, of course, is this panicle is all of the branches branch from the central stem. 
they may branch again and have seeds growing on them or at their terminus. So they branch and branch again. A contracted panicle is one that's maybe so thick you don't see through it, like giant reed, uh, Johnson grass even, and others. Uh, and then you have an open panicle, which as you can see here, like love grass, you can see every bit of the stem. It's so open that you don't see it. Again, they're branched and branched again, uh, just like uh, the contracted panicle, but they're very thin and wispy in appearance. So let's talk about naming grasses. When we talk about grasses, we very often use common names like this grass in the picture is a crabgrass. We can just simply call it crabgrass or hairy crabgrass or broad or southern or large, but it's one plant and it's called Digitaria sanguinellus. In other words, Digitaria like fingers, sanguine like blood, okay? It has two names, the genus and the species. And a species is the last epithet that gives it the final characteristic to put it in its very narrow little grouping, okay? Now, what's really interesting is how to remember names, okay? It's just like anything else. It's like, <laughs> like I said, like eating elephant. Eating elephant is, can be accomplished, but only one bite at a time. So let's just start with grass names. And we'll just start with basically five. Now, the question is, which ones? Well, let's start with something that means something more significant to us. This is the state of Texas. So why don't we start with the Texas state grass? And the Texas state grass is Cynodes grama or Butaloa curtipedola. Okay. Now, that's the Texas state grass. We should remember that one, like the Texas state bird, which is the mockingbird, okay? And you know, we also have a Texas state plant. And the Texas state plant is not, what? It is a cactus. Everybody says, Oh, it's a, you know, a, a blue stem or a, something. No, the Texas state plant is prickly pear cactus. And everybody thinks, oh, it's blue bonnets. No, blue bonnets is the Texas state flower. So you got to be really cautious. Then just an aside. Now, when settlers were settling the West, we found great big grasses in the uh, open plains or in the big grasslands uh, of western the U.S. And there were four predominant grasses there still. And we have these in Texas still. We have big blue stem and a little blue stem. And then we have yellow Indian grass and switchgrass. These are the big four. And when you hear people talking about the big four grasses, this is the group that they're talking about. They're not related other than the blue stems, perhaps. But we have four different grasses that were very, very prominent throughout the state. Now, because of burning, because of uh, the introduction of uh, crops and agricultural uh, areas removing pastures, we're not seeing a lot of big blue stem anymore. Uh, if you go find some undisturbed areas with traditional big uh, grassland growth, you can still find big blue stem. It's not rare, uh, but it's just not common, like little blue stem, Indian grass, and switchgrass. Now, switchgrass is probably one of the largest bunch grasses that we have in Texas. And it's very easy to identify. And I'll show you pictures of all these grasses here in just a moment. 
So the smallest grass in Texas we could talk about is buffalo grass, perhaps. And the largest grass is this giant reed or river cane, as some people call it, which is arondodonex. Now, guess what? We have grass pest. Everybody knows about Johnson Folly, Johnson grass, or the common sand burr, purple three on, right? Uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. But we have gramas, blue, hairy, red, tall, and Texas grama. And some people ask, if you have a Texas grama, why isn't it the state grass? Well, it's just too small. It's a little bitty tiny grass, and uh, it's just not as big and as prolific as the Texas uh, grass, which is Sinotes grama. Then, of course, we have a lot of blue stems, so we have this list of blue stems that you can learn from Bushy, Cane, King Ranch, which is not a pleasant grass at all. It's an invasive or silky and silver. And other common grasses, we have love grasses, muleys, panicums, and past palums. I'm gonna go, because of time, I'm gonna go through a list here pretty quick. We have basically about nine love grasses. We have uh, three muleys. Lindheimer muley is one that I want to talk about a bit. It's Lindheimer's Mullenbergia, Lindheimer eye. And it's a big grass that we can use as an ornamental. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Then we have the witch grasses and panicums that are common. Common witch grass, clean grass, and vine mesquite. And we go along to past palums. We have four, like Dallas grass, Long Tom, Harry Seed, and Vasey grass. Now, what's really important about past palums is they're very, very dense with big, large seeds. And if you want to have a land where turkeys and quail will thrive, make sure you have plenty of past palums on there, like Dallas grass and vasey grass. They love those seeds. They're stacked on there. Those seeds look like uh, uh, watermelon seeds. They're kind of flat and round or tomato seeds probably a little bit more. Now, be before you knew it, we've gone through di 40 different species of grasses right there. So remember, the smallest, here's what, if you take away anything, remember the smallest grass the largest grass, the state grass, and the big four. That should give you seven grasses that you can become very familiar with, and we go from there. Now, as I said, grasses make great forage for cattle and uh, other wildlife, okay? And food and shelter for birds uh, and other animals. Nesting materials, this is a Canyon Wren, which is North America's largest wren, and he's built this rest, uh, nest out of switchgrass, one of the largest of the big four. We have food and shelter for uh, insects. We've identified over 30 uh, butterflies that actually use a species of grass, at least, as a uh, basic forage and or a host plant for laying eggs and having their caterpillars feed on the grass. We make mu musical reeds out of uh, grasses. A rhododonax is actually cultivated in several places for some of the best musical reeds for woodwind instruments like oboes, clarinets, saxophones, and uh, others, okay? Now, we also talked about land stabilization. If we talk about land stabilization, one of the things to think about is native grasses. Native grasses are an attractive choice. First, they come in many different colors and textures and many, many different sizes for a visual scale. I'll show you some photographs in, in some landscaping. 
But most important is native grasses, and the, the selection of native grass is a very wise choice. It's because it's a natural biological selection, there's good soil penetration. And what that does is give the soil two things of protection. It prevents runoff, recharges, recharges our aquifer, and it gives the soil the ability to break up so that it's not so compact and we have aeration of the soil. And many of our plants can have root penetration 10 to 20 foot in our areas, even through the cracks in limestone. And because of that, it's an economical choice, which includes the fact that little water is required of native grasses. And after it's established, you really don't have to do any fertilizing for it. And it's mostly uh, pest and disease resistant. And many people plant yards out of things like buffalo grass or turfalo, we'll talk about, uh, and they don't mow it at all because it only grows about six inches tall and it kind of falls over, which gives you kind of an undulating uh, yard appearance. Now, you can't go play golf on it or putt on it, but uh, it's a very good grassland. They also have secondary benefits, as we've talked about before, because they attract wildlife, they're good food and storage, and uh, habitat for nesting for wildlife. But now, let's be cautious in our selection of grasses for uh, stabilization, restoration, and beautification. This is pampas grass. A lot of people, of course, understand pampas grass, but they don't realize that it's an invasive grass. Over the life of the plant, one of these seed heads can create over a million seeds in its lifetime, and they're blown by the wind. The roots are very invasive, and they'll go everywhere. And Unfortunately, this thick bunch makes an excellent home for rats and mice and all those kind of things, which you don't particularly want to have in your yard. So if you're looking for landscaping, look at big grasses like Lindheimer's muley uh, for your accent plants and or your corners like this house and this house is using switchgrass. It's a big bunch grass. It's going to get really big. They're trying to cover an electrical uh, transformer and their, uh, I guess, cable box. Uh, and unfortunately, the fire plug, which is going to cause problems later. But it's a good grass for doing so. Uh, it, sometimes it's very pretty. This is uh, Mexican feather grass. And you can see the very tender very delicate seed heads with the sunlight coming through it. And again, another young planting of Moulin Bergia over here in this uh, landscaping area. Now, here's a list of choice native grasses for use. And there are several, depending on whether you want to do a, a lawn or showy grasses, uh, large accents or small accents and those kind of things. Now, you don't need to remember all this, but you do, I think, need to be aware of these two areas. Number one is my friend Bill and Chad Neiman of the Native American Seed Company in Junction. It's called seedsource.com, uh, or you can look at their phone number. Uh, they have been around here in Central Texas for years and years, and are a very excellent source for native seeds. Not just grasses, but wildflowers and other forms as well. Now, with my facility at A&M, through the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute, or CKWRI, we have now the Texas Native Seeds Program that's been going for about 10 years. And Tony Falk and Shyla Rabe are the two contact people there. All you have to do is Google Texas Native Seeds and you'll get their website. Their website is part of this CKWRI website. It's soon going to be broken out, so I can't give you a, uh, 
a definite URL yet, but they've been around for 10 years and they're doing a very, very good job. They do have offices and locations in six areas throughout the state of Texas, including uh, in uh, the Hill Country. I guess he's out of Stephenville, uh, the guy up there. All right. Now, one thing I want to point you to are native invasive, actually inva invasive plants, not natives, but invasive plants. And the best thing to do is look at this site called Texas Invasive Database or uh, their database on invasive plants. Now, they have invasive plants, animals, and everything. I pulled up King Ranch Blue Stem, KR Blue Stem, Othracola is Shaman. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is we have this list down at the bottom of the page are many different organizations that go around and plot invasives. Okay. Some are high school groups, some are groups like, uh, uh, Clubs, uh, Highland Lakes has Highland Lake Invaders. Uh, we've got uh, uh, people like Master Gardeners, Master Naturalists have invasive uh, plant huh, detectives, if you wish, and they plot these, and ultimately all this stuff ends up on a map. Now, it's not complete because I know you can see KR Blue Stem everywhere in South Texas, but it's a really interesting thing. And if you want to know about invasive plants, this is a very, very good place to go. So with only a couple of minutes left, I want to talk about and show you some pictures of grasses that we should know. The state uh, grass of Texas, Cytoscrema, little blue stem, big blue stem. We also call it turkey foot because of the way the seed head looks. Yellow Indian grass, switch grass, bushy blue stem, and we've talked about these before, uh, like with bushy blue stem being an indicator of some surface water. Buffalo grass, now I did want to point out in this particular picture that buffalo grass takes two plants to uh, germinate. We have female plants that have the seed heads up here and male plant, I'm sorry, the male plants are above, the female plants are, are below. The male pollen lands in the female receptors and we have fertilization. Undoubtedly, we probably think the giant reed is probably one of the biggest grasses in Texas. This is Shirley and Shirley is five foot two. So if you look at this, this grass is probably 12 to 14 feet tall. Uh, it's very, very uh, busy. It's very ubiquitous. We can see it all over. I, we think it was brought to Texas by the railroads who wanted to stabilize cuts that they made in the roadway and with bridges and trestles and those kind of things. Uh, Not root and southwestern bristle grasses are very pretty grasses. They reflect a lot of light. They look very delicate and very uh, feather-like when the light strikes them from behind. We have broadleaf wood oats. Some people used to call this inland sea oats or wild oat. And Canada and Virginia wild rye. Blue grama, hairy grama, and Texas grama. We call these eyebrow grasses because they look like eyebrows. And poor Texas grama just never grows big enough. Bermuda grass and big blue stem. And when we did our work, we did a lot of work in photographing and we had to document our photography with actual plant samples. So we created herbarium samples, which was a preserved uh, component of the grass, the entire plant glued down to white sheets of paper with all of the collection data about them, where and when and what was growing around them and those kind of things. 
and poor Shirley has mounted over 600 of these grasses for our project. And our herbarium samples are at the SM Tracy Herbarium at Texas A&M and at the herbarium here at University of Texas in Austin. So researchers now can go back through these original samples and learn more about grasses. So there's a lot of variety in grasses, as you can see just on these pages. And our whole goal is to help restore native grasslands, to keep our Texas areas nice and green, to create and to maintain pasture areas and rural areas that are really abundant with grass and keep the whole thing good for not only ourselves, but expand for those folks around us. So understanding the communities is just the beginning. As I said, if you like something, you'll learn about it. And if you learn about it, you're going to uh, conserve it. And I think that's the name of the game for us in uh, in our work. Okay, so that's it for the presentation. And now I'm now up to questions if anybody needs questions and answers. Okay, I was going to go through. Uh, thank you so much. That was just really wonderful. I'm going to go through the chat and see if we have any questions on there. And uh, let me just flip on through here. Um, okay, so how much has Cal Creek changed since the big floods? Uh, you know what? It's really interesting. It has changed, but I think for the better. Uh, what's really interesting is we took groups up through there before the floods, and we found lots of stuff. During Immediately thereafter, there was really kind of a, what do you want to call it, kind of a scraping of the land. But we've been back since, and we've seen plants up there that we've never seen before, including Lady Tress's orchids, which uh, we never saw up there before. And we've seen some that are uh, really, really nice and really good. So we need to do things like fire and flood on our lands from time to time. Prescribed burns is a very effective way of managing grasslands because it needs to get cleared out and and burn off what they call the duff, the understory uh, junk that's down there. Now, what's inter interesting is I showed you a habitat picture of side oats grama, and it was really big. That plant was about five foot tall, and it was one year growth after a prescribed burn at uh, Colorado Bend State Park. So it does really good. Wow. Okay, so there's a question here. Is the largest grass river cane native? No. No, not only is it not native, it was brought in, we think, by the railroads to stabilize uh, some of their uh, construction areas where they damaged the soils and made cuts and bridges and all those kind of things. Now, what's interesting about river cane is it is it's not sterile, but it is really, really rare that it will germinate from seeds. It does produce seeds, uh, but most of the time, let's call it non-fertile. They're not sterile. There's a difference between sterile and non-fertile. But they grow rapidly by these underground root and rhizome systems that you saw. So it's really an invasive because of that growth. Okay, um, the question, will climate change have an impact on our grasses? Of course. Okay. Um, <laughs> you want right. me to expand? That's, that's a book. That, that's, okay. a weekend, that's a weekend program. Yes, climate change is affecting anything and everything we do. Now, uh, some climate change is helpful. You know, there is... If you want to look at the greatest issue with climate change, I think, is uh, carbon transfer or carbon dioxide transfer. And so the problem is, can we do things to get carbon dioxide 
out of the atmosphere. And if we can have plants that fix carbon dioxide, we call it carbon dioxide fixation, like legumes, if we can generate more and more of that and have more and more carbon transfer, uh, we can do better. So that's part of one of the roles that grasses and vascular plants can help with uh, climate change. Okay, and I have a personal question for me. Um, to encourage native grasses, uh, and let's say we have some a lot of KR blue stem, and we're trying to encourage natives, um, would you say mow or don't mow the area? Well, here's, here's the thing about mowing. In one way, mowing is stimulating uh, growth, okay? Because you take a plant, you cut off, ideal mowing leaves a third of a plant stem, right? Okay, so let's talk about mowing. So if you leave a third of the plant stem, you have stimulated the plant to replace the parts that are missing. So if you're taking an invasive and mowing it, generally speaking, you're going to encourage its continuing to grow. However, having said that, depends on when you mow. Now, if you really want to mow an invasive grass, mow it before the seeds mature, so you eliminate the distribution of mature seeds. Uh, but the only way to really get an invasive grass out is to replace it by a grass that's called an increaser, one that has the, uh, the ability to increase in its growth and expansion over the other grasses that are competitive. And so if you go into an area that has a lot of KR blue stem, the very first thing you got to do is you got to mow it, not mow it down, you got to rake it out of there and, you, and scarify the soil and replace that with an increaser grass, like a little blue stem, an old world blue stem, not a new world, like KR King Ranch, uh, and or uh, another grass that is an increaser grass that will replace it and be the top dog grass instead of the KR blue stem. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so there was uh, another question that looks here. Uh, uh, where can we find your book? Amazon.com or uh, Texas A&M University Press online. Go to Texas A&M University Press online. You can order individual copies or many copies or uh, Amazon.com under the book section. You can find them there as well. Okay. Um, I think you might have already mentioned it, but there was, is there a good way to get rid of KR blue stem? So is there anything else you want to add to that? No, it, it, it's pretty ubiquitous. Here's the thing. You've got to replace it with something that is more robust and is an increaser, not a decreaser. And the differences between an increaser and a decreaser is, does it increase in biomass in abundance when it's disturbed, like with mowing and or cattle grazing, okay? So if cattle graze on a grass that's a decreaser, other grasses will come in and take its place. So you've got to get a robust increaser grass and my suggestion is to look at these two sources, either the Native Seeds Program at uh, CKWRI at A&M, or look at uh, seedsource.com, Texas Native uh, Seeds. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm gonna stop the recording now.